Well, uh, dear colleagues, dear Natalie, uh, welcome uh, to this uh, evening meeting with Natalie Docce, the director of the Italian Institute of International Affairs and advisor both to um, Federica Mogherini in her time when she was high representative. I don't know if you also advise her in her capacity as rector of the College of Europe. And of course, um, uh, now of uh, Josip Borrell, uh, the new high representative. Um, I have to say uh, in my courses, in one of my courses, I've told the colleagues who participate in that course that if you really want to influence international relations, you have to speak with pen holders. And I've never in my life uh, met such an effective pen holder as you were, Natalie, when you drafted the European Union's global strategy. And we are now five years after that uh, remarkable uh, exercise. And I would, it would, of course, be interesting to hear how you think it has stood the test of time. You spoke of many things in the global strategy, I mean, the, the global strategy that are of key importance to international relations today. Uh, you spoke about resilience. You spoke about Europe's security. You spoke about our cooperative relations with neighbors. You spoke about an integrated approach that we should have when dealing with conflicts. You spoke of selective engagement with Russia. You call it a little differently, but it was uh, precisely uh, that. You spoke of the importance of effective uh, multilateralism. You spoke of the need for unity in the European Union. And now we are uh, five years later. We've gone through a particularly challenging experience in our transatlantic relations uh, in the last uh, four years. When it comes to selective engagement with Russia, we saw how this effort uh, by High Representative Borrell was welcomed uh, when he went to Moscow. And obviously, uh, we have a constant challenge uh, in dealing with unity uh, within the uh, European Union. And you also spoke, uh, and I think this was a particular uh, uh, an issue that was particularly close to the heart of Mrs. Mogherini, of the need for a credible enlargement policy of the European Union. And I don't know how far we have moved on that uh, in the last uh, five years. But as I said, um, I remember this exercise when you drafted this. One of the greatest challenges of being a pen holder is that your products don't leak too early. I've never seen an exercise like this where we were only allowed to read the drafts in a little room without being able to take notes. And then we had to leave again. And it's in fact the only big text of the European Union that I can remember that didn't leak uh, before it was published. But it's not only about not leaking before it gets published, it's also about uh, how you judge its effects five years later. And with that uh, introduction that has already been too long, I pass the floor uh, to Natalie Tocci. You are most welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, for that, for that inter introduction. And, um, uh, and indeed, I'll, I'll, I'll try actually not to talk too much because uh, I'd really sort of, you know, like the opportunity to, to engage with all of you. But let me begin um, in order to answer your question uh, to sort of start with, the, with an anecdote, uh, which um, sort of, well, it's actually almost uh, a year now, now that I think of it. Um, a year ago when I started, probably a little, li little less than a year, but when I started uh, in my sort of, well, I renewed my role as a special advisor to the current uh, HRVP. I was having a chat with him and, and of course, you know, the sort of first thing that you ask yourself uh, when you're a special advisor is great, fantastic, what does a special advisor do? And, uh, and you know, my answer to that with, with Federica in, uh, well, it was actually the first conversation I had with her was in November 2014, uh, was uh, when, you know, sort of uh, just after, or just before actually her hearing, um, I said, well, I know what I can do. I can write a new strategy. And, uh, and it took a couple of years to, to do that, but, but it was obvious to me that the previous strategy had, that had uh, been uh, published 13 years uh, before, in 2003, uh, sort of on to 2016, 
um, obviously did really need to be updated. Huh? I mean, we didn't live in a world that was so free and so prosperous and so secure. The context had changed dramatically. Um, and it was a change of context that really had, because, you know, context is always change huh, by definition, but it was a change of context which really did uh, and, and was changing the role of the European Union in the world. I mean, I would say that the period that really began with the birth of ESDP uh, through to, I would say, the sort of early 2010s, uh, if we're really being generous, was in a sense an era that in shorthand we define as the international liberal order. Uh, and within that international liberal order, the European Union had a particular global identity, which uh, particularly, you know, you as a students and academics often refer to as normative power Europe. And this was really the sense of the European Union in the world through its soft power, through its civilian power, through its normative power, uh, it would expand its norms, its rules, its standards, uh, particularly to countries nearby, obviously beginning with the enlargement uh, countries, but then obviously extending to the neighborhood countries and extended beyond. And in fact, going global as well in the sense of, you know, being a model for regional cooperation in different world regions. And that was really the world that we lived in. When uh, Mogherini took office, it was obvious that that world was fading away. Uh, perhaps it was not as obvious as it is now, but it was still, you know, fairly clear by then that there had been an annexation of Crimea. Uh, you know, the, you know the, the Middle East was uh, imploding, given that the Arab uprisings had too soon turned into their winter. So a number of things were, were changing, which really kind of, um, yeah, chided with this notion of, of normative power Europe. So it wasn't simply that events were happening. I mean, events always happen, but the, those events were really leading to a pretty profound debate about the EU's own role in the world. So, you know, I come back to the anecdote, which I actually didn't give you, which was, you know, when uh, Josep asked me, hey, do you want to stay on a special advisor? I said, well, yes, thanks. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, and, and then he said, well, do you want to write a strategy? And, uh, and I said, no. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, no, frankly speaking, completely against my own interests, because, you know, what people like me do is write papers, you know, I'm, I'm not a doer, I'm a writer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm not someone who works, as Thomas knows very well, within the institutions, I'm someone that straddles between the institutions and uh, the academic world, the think tank world, civil society, etc. Uh, so in a sense, it was kind of obvious for me to say, well, yes, obviously, yes, go for it. You know, context has changed, COVID, what have you, I write a new strategy. But I said to him, look, you know, I would be intellectually and politically dishonest with you if I told you that what we needed now is a new strategy. Um, because, yes, and I'll come to this in a moment, obviously, uh, there, there have been big changes uh, in the world, in Europe, etc. But I just don't believe, and I'll spend the rest of the talk explaining why, that these changes in context really redefine or lead a sort of, you know, sort of lead to a redefinition of what is it that we have to do and therefore what, a what our strategy should be. That's one set of reasons, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into, in a moment, I'll go into a bit of detail as to why I think that's the case. Uh, the second, which in a sense is the, it's the more intellectual reason. Mm -hmm. um, the more political reason why I said, I said to him, no, I think it's a terrible idea, uh, and I don't think I should do this, um, is that, and again, you know, Tom, Thomas will know this uh, far, far better than, than I do, um, you know, the institutions, I mean, to an extent, one can make this case, you know, perhaps for all, you know, uh, government, you know, states as well. But I think there's something particular about EU institutions, whereby there is this real confusion between the production of paper and action. And um, it is just so easy to write yet another paper. And, you know, I, I found 
you know, sort of the years after the, the global strategy becoming in this respect, increasingly frustrating because you say, well, okay, fine, 13 years have passed and therefore we need a, a new strategy. We have a new strategy and, you know, strategy comes out in 2016 and then you say, well, okay, well now, now, now it's the action, you know, now, now surely the action is going to come. Now I'm not responsible for the action, but surely, you know, others are. But no, that's not what happens, yeah? Because after you have a strategy, you have an implementation plan. And after you have an implementation plan, then you have a document on PESCO, you have a document on the military planning and conduct capability, you have uh, uh, documents on a civilian compact, uh, and now, hey, now we're working on a strategic compass as well. So we kind of, you know, produce all this paper, which would be kind of okay if this was actually accompanied by action, but often at times, in fact, I would say, particularly at this point in time, it is not. Now, I, I think that it would be unfair to say it has always been like this. I mean, I remember sort of having, you know, sort of this, uh, you know, let's pull pulling hair out session, uh, talking about it with, with Solana, actually. It was about, a, a, well, it was when we could still travel, so it must have been about a year and a half ago. Um, and, and he reminded me of something that, you know, had I thought about it, I, I, I would have known, but I had kind of, you know, sort of, I, I was in this kind of despairing mode of, you know, we never act, we never act. Um, and, and he reminded me that actually in the early years of CSDP, um, actually, you know, th th there weren't many strategies around. Okay, fine, in 2003 came the European security strategy, but there weren't that many documents around. And if you think about it, if one is just to stick with the more security and defense aspect of all of this, some, if not the most ambitious uh, missions and operations that were conducted, were conducted without strategies and implementation plans and compacts and PESCOs and, uh, and what have you. So there was a sense of just do it in the sort of early 2000s that I think at this point in time has, has really been lost. Uh, and so the reason why I told Borrell, uh, I think, you know, I, I would feel politically, not just intellectually, but politically uh, dishonest, is that I just would feel part of the problem. And I think that part of the problem that we're living through at the moment is that we talk and write too much and we just do too little anyway so that's the reason that's the political reason why i said no let me now now given that we are in an academic context uh get uh, more into the detail of the in a sense intellectual reason uh why why i said no uh, and indeed as i said it may sound counterintuitive and it may sound counterintuitive because very obviously quite a lot of pretty big things have happened uh, both internally in the union and of course externally in the international system uh, it is obvious that uh, we now know in a way which we didn't only i would say a year and a half ago uh, that the international system is crystallizing in not simply a sort of amorphous multipolarity, but possibly a renewed form of bipolarity. And one in which the different sectoral conflicts uh, between the United States and China on trade issues, on digital issues, on security questions, which of course existed uh, and, and accentuated over the years, have now been uh, in a sense, coupled with, or rather they have an overlay of a political and ideological, in a sense, overstructure to this, to this conflict, um, which really does pit, in many respects, liberal democracies uh, on the one hand and authoritarian, illiberal, whatever you want to call them, uh, uh, countries on, on the other. And this is, of course, something that in 2016 was not that clear huh? and there was a sense that we may be moving in that direction but it was not it was not that clear uh, in the same way as it was not that clear that actually um, the EU itself would have in many respects at least internally um, refound 
uh, it would have refound a sense of, uh, of purpose, you know, which actually, so, you know, the, 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 the international is on the negative. On the internal, in a sense, I think there's a rather positive story to be told, huh? which again, may, may, may sound a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, I personally think that 2020 was, sounds horrible to say, put it in these terms, was a good year for the European Union. I mean, it could have been uh, the year that we you know it could have been the crisis to end all crises in the sense that there wouldn't have been a, have been a European Union at all to speak of uh, had the union not risen to the challenge of COVID-19 internally I mean after the sort of half-baked response to the eurozone crisis uh, after the complete failed response to the migration crisis had there also been a failure to stand up more or less united, I mean, united a la European, to COVID-19, it would have been, you know, game over. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen because probably everyone realized that no one could afford another utter failure. Now, you know, we're still obviously navigating this mess and let's see what happens over, um, you know, what's the end point of the story over the distribution of the, of, of the, of the vaccines, etc. Uh, but there is a sense that an important step change has been made through next generation EU, etc. So obviously, big thing. You know, I'm not. I'm not um, uh, sort of you know trying to argue against the fact that big things have happened. My point, though, is that the big things that have happened, in my view, actually have reinforced. They have strengthened. Maybe they have enlarged. Um, the, 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 the sort of meaning, the interpretation of all, I would say, of the goals of the EU global strategy. And also all of the means that were identified by the global strategy, which is why I think that the point now should not be that of writing another document, inventing God knows what goals, but rather accelerating in practice uh, the, the accomplishment of, of those goals. And let me go through each one and give you a sense, and I'll spend you know, more time on some and, and less on others, but give you my sense of, of, of why they remain pertinent, uh, why, why they remain the priorities, uh, why they're pertinent, and how, if anything, has their meaning changed. Now, I think in many respects, uh, the two most, or I, 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 let me put it this way, I think that three are the priorities which um, have become far more important now uh, than they were in 2016, and far more important because their meaning has been expanded uh, to encompass various other questions. Another two, the, the other two that I'm not going to talk about that much, are, are priorities which I still consider to be extremely important, but I don't really see why they are, how can I put it, uh, qualitatively, not simply quantitatively, more important than they were in 2016. So the two that I will not talk about are the integrated approach to conflicts and crises and regional cooperation. Uh, basically because Conflicts and crises, well, yes, we still have lots of them, don't we? In fact, we've got more of them uh, than we did in 2016. We didn't have a, a new war in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, we didn't have uh, tensions escalating in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, we didn't have conflict consolidating uh, in Libya in a manner that basically sees Turkey and Russia uh, sharing the spoils. So we didn't have a number of things, but we still had, you know, we still had Syria and we still had Yemen. I mean, you know, we haven't solved any of these. We've simply added on more to the list. So, uh, and I think that the approach that we should be pursuing remains the same, as I was hinting at earlier. To me, the main difficulty and the main problem that I have is not that we should think of God knows what new way to, to go about it, we should do it. And, and the fact that, you know, what only needs to look at our total, total passivity in conflicts like Libya, uh, like Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, you know, like the situation in, in Belarus, to really, you know, sort of pull your hair out uh, about, you know, this is not about writing papers, this is about doing something and, and taking upon oneself the responsibility and the risk to do something. So, you know, conflicts and crisis, that, that's basically it. 
Likewise, regional cooperation, I, you know, I, I don't see major changes there, so I'm not going to spend any, uh, any time on that at all. Let me rather concentrate on the, the security and defense aspect, resilience, which I actually now see as being far more connected uh, than they were, and, and multilateralism. In fact, I think all three of these things are, are connected. I think all three of these things are connected in a way which I personally did not appreciate in 2016. And I think this is what makes them so interesting now. And I think they are all held together by the magic concept, which was actually sort of in the global strategy repeated 20 trillion times, uh, but is now talked about a lot more, which is strategic autonomy. And, and I think security and defense, resilience, multilateralism are now tied by this uh, silver thread. And let me give you a sense of, of why. So, you know, beginning with, with uh, uh, security and defense, as I said, this is the place in the strategy which actually uh, mentions strategic autonomy 20 trillion times, more or less, huh? over, over the course of the strategy. Um, and, and what's interesting is that it mentions strategic autonomy only when we talk about security and defense. So there's this sense of the security of the union, uh, that the EU has to take greater responsibility for its own security. This was pre-Trump, of course, uh, but uh, I remember actually Federica telling me, I mean, you know, uh, it was actually probably the only piece of advice that she did give me <laughs> over the course of, of writing the document. She said, reread it and ask yourself if, if it would still work if Brexit happened and if Trump was elected president of the United States. And we both ha 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 laughed about it. Uh, and then, you know, lo and behold, that's exactly what, what happened. Anyway, but I took her advice actually quite seriously. And so this general sense of, uh, you know, Europeans cannot simply rely, you know, even if we love Obama, we can't simply rely uh, on the United States looking after us forever and ever. Uh, and therefore, and in any case, it's the Americans themselves that are telling us to kind of, you know, wake up a little bit. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, sort of taking upon great responsibility on security and defense and, and doing then the number of things that, uh, that were done. Of course, you know, the, 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 the problem, as I said, there that I see now is that all the instruments and mechanisms are in place that were mentioned in the strategy, more or less. I mean, you know, we don't quite have a headquarter, but we have an MPCC, uh, we have PESCO, um, we have a European Defence Fund. So we kind of have all these instruments. We're not using them. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is where the problem is. Um, but, but the notion of autonomy, which was in that chapter, if you like, of, uh, of the strategy, uh, and therefore it was, you know, sort of really quite restricted uh, to security and defense and really uh, interpreted inevitably, although implicitly, in a transatlantic light, uh, I think today uh, has acquired a far, far broader meaning. Uh, in both geographic and therefore thematic terms. So to me, this is really, if you like, the, 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 the beating heart of it all. Geographically, because you know, if one thinks, well, hang on a second, what does autonomy mean? Well, autonomy means, you know, my Greek uh, studies back in high school days tell me that autonomy means, you know, auto and nomos. So this is the ability of the self to live by its laws. I mean, I'm kind of, you know, perhaps not totally accurate, but more or less huh, as self and law. Um, and, and therefore, this is about the ability of the self, which is the European Union in this particular case, uh, to live by its laws, which are the domestic laws of member states, uh, European law, and of course, international law to which the EU obviously uh, subscribes. Now, you know, it, it is such a no brainer, therefore, that obviously we should want to be autonomous. I mean, who doesn't want to live by its laws? Uh, that one should ask oneself, well, why is it important now? Uh, I mean, why has it emerged now as, as, uh, as a concept, uh, as, as a debate? Well, the reason is that once upon a time, it was taken for granted because uh, the truth is that no one really threatened, uh, uh, you know, to, no one really threatened us and or rather uh, threatened our ability to live by our laws. And to the extent to which 
some did, hmm? Soviet Union, uh, someone else was taking care of it, uh, the United States. And, and this was basically the, the world that we lived in. So we didn't really kind of, it, it didn't occur to us that this is something that we had to do by ourselves. Now, of course, now we live in, in a world in which on the one hand, there is this question mark as to, I mean, now with Biden, not the willingness perhaps, but perhaps the ability or the relative ability of the United States to protect us. Uh, which, of course, raises, you know, sort of half of, of the big question mark. And of course, the truth is that now we also know that there are others that do want to uh, sort of impinge on, on our norms and rules and, uh, and, and ways of life, if you like, because we know that Russia tries to do so uh, through disinformation, uh, through the weaponization of energy, for instance. Uh, we know that uh, China tries to do it uh, through strategic uh, investments, also through disinformation, through cyber. I mean, we know that all this happens. And of course, we know that the United States as well has tried to do it when that willingness to protect us was not really that strong, meaning uh, over the last four years uh, with the Trump administration through, for instance, the use of secondary sanctions. So we know that living by our laws is something that we have to ensure how to do ourselves. But we also know that this obviously does have an important security and defense component, but precisely because it is, it concerns so many actors, it also concerns so many different policy sectors. So strategic autonomy, unlike in the global strategy, is not only about security and defense anymore. It is also about digital, it's about energy, it's about climate. Uh, uh, I would argue it's also about migration. I mean, it is literally about every uh, single uh, policy sphere. It's about the economy, et cetera. So security and defense, the autonomy bit of it, far more important now than it was in 2016. Connected to this, uh, it is, in my view, the resilience piece of the puzzle. And why do I see it as being connected? Because in the global strategy, of course, resilience was uh, mainly, in fact, no, it was exclusively uh, concerned with surrounding regions, huh? uh, the resilience of states and societies in surrounding regions, meaning in the enlargement countries and the neighborhood countries, but then also further afield, stretching into Central Asia uh, and down into Central Africa. Uh, now, obviously, the co concept of resilience, it's a bit like autonomy, it's on everyone's, you know, everyone's mouths, but it's not just the resilience of these fragile surrounding regions, uh, it's the European Union that talks about its own resilience, and hey, it's even, you know, in Joe Biden's inaugural speech, you know, he talked about the, the, you know, the fragility and therefore the importance of resilience of American democracy. So all of a sudden this concept, it's as if now we are far more cognizant that the fragilities that we see around us are also in ourselves. So this to me makes the concept far more important today than it was uh, five, uh, five years ago. And of course it's connected, as I was saying earlier, to this notion of, uh, of autonomy, because of course the more resilient you are, uh, the more able you are to withstand the pressure of those external actors that are trying to impinge upon your norms and rules and laws, uh, etc. So in my mind, the two are, are really part of the same thing. In the same way as they're part of this broader global piece, uh, uh, which is really the multilateralism piece. Uh, because again, if autonomy is about living by one's laws, how do you live by your laws? Well, you live by them by, there's an element of protection, which is in a sense more internal, but there's also an element of promotion. Because of course, you're only really able to live by your norms and, 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 and rules and, and laws if externally you're able to participate in shaping those international uh, rules and, and norms and, and laws. And of course, how do you do that? by strengthening multilateralism. This is the way in which the European Union does so. Is multilateralism more important now than it was five years ago? Absolutely so. It is so obvious today, uh, far more, although we did, you know, it, it, was, it was already to an extent clear in 20, 2015, 2016, but I think it's much clearer now that the main challenges of our age are 
essentially transnational in nature. We're talking about health, we're talking about demography and migration, we're talking about digital, we're talking about climate. I mean, I can't think of you know, anything that is more important than those four things. All of them cannot be addressed uh, at, a, at a merely national level. They can't even be addressed at a European level. It is obvious that they can only be addressed internationally and therefore multilaterally. So anyway, I realized that I've already spoken uh, far too much and I, I really did want to sort of now, you know, open up and, 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 and have the opportunity of have a con you know, having a conversation with, with all of you. But that was basically my rather uh, long-winded half hour answer, Thomas, to your question. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Natalie, and thank you for your energy and for doing it on such a broad basis. I mean, obviously, I would have questions of my own. The first one being what you then decided with the high representative that you would do when you said you won't do a strategy. So if you can give an inkling later on on what your, uh, your specific role as a senior advisor now is, it would be interesting. And obviously, I mean, uh, I listened. Uh, I listened to you. You were sort of saying you were summing up the areas which have re remained as important as they were, and those that have become even more important. So, I mean, for me, the obvious question would be that while the writer Natalie uh, says. Uh, these are more important, are the doers in the European Union and in the member states of the European Union uh, doing the necessary to make this more important. You said there's no area uh, where it is clearer that you need multilateralism than in, when it comes to vaccination and health issues. And yet we have these phenomena of what is called um, uh, vaccination nationalism and some other issues. And I mean, one could one could point uh, to other areas as well, multilateralism. So, But I don't want to monopolize this on my end. So my suggestion would be that I collect groups of questions, say three questions or four at a time, uh, and mine don't count uh, in this first list now. So if you can take them on board indirectly, I would be grateful. And I would ask colleagues uh, to make a sign, either physically or virtually, on their screen, uh, whether they, if they have a question and want to come in. The floor is yours. Who would like to... Uh, avail himself or herself of this opportunity. We can, of course, ask Natalie to go on for another half an hour, but I think it would be better if you come in with some questions and concerns of your own. Uh, Professor, can I ask a question? Yes, please Absolutely. do. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Tachi, for being here with us. It's a great privilege. Uh, I'm Martina, I'm Italian. Um, thank you also for sharing the frustration that you feel when it comes to the implementation phase in the European Union, which I guess is quite shared. So my question is quite easy, I think. Um, if you can help us to understand what actually happens in between the words, so when a strategy is written, a strategy, an initiative, a project, and whatever, and its actual implementation. So what are the main problems that comes that make so hard and that also uh, made you take this decision of not writing a new strategy for Mr. Burrell? Thank you very much. Thank you. Further questions? Who would like to come in? Well, if you're still reflecting, I will in the meantime add one of my own. Um, you spoke about the uh, things that remain important and you spoke about the role of European, the European Union in conflict regulation uh, from, a, from, the, from the beginning to the end of the uh, conflict. And amongst all conflicts, you mentioned Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, if there's one where the European Union has a less visible role from point A to point Z, uh, it's Nagorno-Karabakh, so I mean, it would be it would be interesting again uh, for you uh, to to make the sort of comparison between the the principle you're defending and the realities. Further questions? Um, hello, good evening. Uh, I would have a question um, about the, the global strategy itself. In the foreword by uh, Federica Mogherini. Um, she uh, wrote um, that uh, traditionally the EU is considered as a civilian power, 
but that uh, now the EU uh, for the EU a soft and a hard power should go hand in hand. You have already uh, evoked uh, the different instruments which have been put in place in the field of uh, the European defense policy, for example. But do, do you think that it is actually what uh, has happened or is happening? And if so, what do you think will it change for, for the EU in, in the coming years? Thank you. Thank you. I think I can take at least one more question. Anybody else? I see some people hesitating. So if you can overcome uh, your hesitation, you're most welcome. Hello, Professor. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Tocci, for being here. Um, I'm Raffaele. I was um, wondering, you were talking about the EU in a quite um, unitary way, as it is um, a unitary actor. But in fact, uh, uh, you were uh, also mentioning it when you were talking about resilience, uh, that there are challenges that the EU uh, needs to uh, uh, tackle also internally. And one of these is uh, actually that some member states have certain liberal tendencies. Um, my question would be like, what's, um, how can the EU uh, be a normative power if there, uh, some member states do not share the same values anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think Natalie will will leave you with this block of questions and come with a second set afterwards. Fantastic. Okay, so um, let me uh, let, let me let me take these in order. Actually, um, so well, what do I do with a high representative? Um, it is a totally different uh, role compared to, and what I'm going to say is actually very counterintuitive, huh? uh, but um, it's a totally different role compared to what it was uh, with, with Mogherini. So I guess that um, for most people, I mean, including, you know, people maybe like you, Thomas, that were inside the, uh, the machine, I think the sort of common understanding was, well, obviously, you know, you know, these are the two Italian ladies, they've obviously known each other for a long time, and they have a close personal relationship. Well, the truth is that actually, that's not the case. <laughs> uh, in the sense that I, when, when, I mean, obviously, I have a good relationship with, uh, with, with Federica, um, but we, we didn't speak very often at all. Uh, our interaction was 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 really very limited. There was a lot of trust there. Uh, that that's that's for sure. But there was very little personal interaction. There was far more interaction uh, with the with with the institutions. Huh? Uh, and you know, I mean, by institutions, I don't mean only EU institutions, but I mean, you know, everything that I did, you know, with the member states and, you know, and I guess, you know, sort of this is, this is actually fairly, fairly well known. But, but the point is, what is probably not well known is that I didn't, you know, maybe over the course of the whole drafting of the global strategy, I maybe I talked to Federica two or three times. I mean, not, not more than that. Now, in my current position, it's exactly the reverse. Uh, again, you know, maybe in a way which is probably not very intuitive at all. I have a far more frequent personal contact uh, with the HRVP, but on spot issues. And I have very little, uh, compared to the past, broader institutional contact uh, with, uh, with the EAS. And I think this has, in a sense, less to do with the personality of who the HRVP is, and more to do with the way in which um, the the broader machinery, obviously beginning with the cabinet, is uh, is organised. So to me, it's been quite a sort of interesting contrast because it's exactly the opposite of what one would imagine, <laughs> uh, and and it really goes to show how perhaps even more important than who the quote unquote commander in chief is, is the way in which the institutions function. So people matter, but not necessarily kind of only people at the top. Huh? Um, so, you know, that, that spot interaction can be about anything, you know, it's about the, com, you know, the, the, the problem of the day. Uh, and it's about having that external perspective on that, you know, sort of crisis of the day. So that's a sort of, you know, um, answer to, to that question, maybe not a particularly satisfying one. Um, on, now, 
I, I think this, the, the, the vaccine nationalism uh, uh, question uh, enables me to actually say something that I wanted to say and I didn't say uh, about, about strategic autonomy, which is, um, now I think that there are uh, kind of, how can I put it, uh, silly criticisms <laughs> about strategic autonomy and actually quite serious ones. The silly criticisms are the ones that really revolve around security and defense. It's about, oh, you know, if we become autonomous, this is against the transatlantic relationship and it's against NATO. And I say it's silly for the simple reason that it's just so far from the truth huh? uh, and, uh, and so detached from reality, which, you know, that, that I think, you know, one, one is simply focusing on the wrong problem. Now, having said that, I actually do think that there are some fair, not criticisms, but fair risks when one talks about autonomy, uh, which are more relevant when one thinks about autonomy in its uh, industrial uh, also connotations, whether by industry, whether it's about digital industry or it's about pharmaceutical industry or it's about, you know, um, and, and I think those risks are internal risks uh, about you know, the concentration of power in the hands of a few strong, which often tends to be a few strong member states. So creating greater imbalances within the union. So for instance, when we have the whole debate about European champions, uh, I'm all for European champions, uh, because indeed, you know, the competition is on the global marketplace and we are thinking about China and, and, and China, of course, subsidizes its industries and everything else that we know. But we can't not see the risk that by promoting European champions, we may actually be promoting an excessive concentration of power in the hands uh, of those that are already strong. So that's one risk. The other risk of strategic autonomy is protectionism. And I think, you know, nowhere is this clearer than now in the debate that we're having about vaccine nationalism, where in words, we are there as European Union at the forefront saying bad, bad, bad vaccine nationalism. But of course, what we end up doing in the practice is export controls. Uh, and again, I'm not arguing here that it is wrong. I see the re I mean, I, it's my prime minister that started this. <laughs> so I, I see the reason why it's gone the way it has. It's going the way it's going. But all I'm saying here is that I think it's important to recognize that there is a tension there, you know, as you pursue autonomy, even vis-a-vis -vis big pharma, uh, there is a risk of, of protectionism, of closure. And, and I think, you know, one needs to know where you are in order to navigate the straits. So turning to, to Martina's question, so what happens in between the words and, and, and the action? You know, why is it that the words don't translate in, in the action? I mean, I think that this is particularly true in the more, in a sense, traditional foreign policy uh, domain. I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I don't want to give the impression that I think that the EU does not act. Uh, I think that we, we, as I said, you know, we have acted quite, uh, quite a lot. And, you know, we, we've uh, kind of reached uh, an impressive number of trade agreements, for instance, uh, when the tide was uh, and is uh, for protectionism. Uh, we have reached agreements on, you know, making this leap forward through next generation EU. I mean, we have done a number of things, including in its external uh, sort of, you know, connotations on climate, etc. Where the, the words are not translating in the action is in the more traditional foreign policy sense, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to security and defense and to an extent also diplomacy, uh, but more in the, in the former than, than in the latter. Why it doesn't it happen? I think it's because whereas we um, really, it's as if we understand that, the, you know, intellectually and maybe even politically to an extent, we understand that the world is changing, but we haven't, uh, and therefore that we have to change in response. And so we're happy to write papers about all this. But I think that we are not there yet, practically speaking, in recognizing um, 
or rather being willing to take the costs, not just economic costs, huh, uh, of, uh, of, of what it means to act. And then to put it very brutally, taking risk when it comes to security and defense goes all the way down to, to kind of um, not, you know, acknowledging that body bags may come back home. And, and Europeans are simply not there psychologically. And it's not just governments, it's a public opinion. It's, so it's as if we're, I think, now in the stage of almost cognitive dissonance between kind of knowing that the world has changed and we have to change and blah, 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 blah. blah. But, but, but then when push comes to shove, mm, you know, uh, and so we let Russia and Turkey do what they do in, in Libya and in the Caucasus and, and what have you, and in Syria. So it's as if we're, you know, we're not kind of putting two and two together, basically. Uh, and, and maybe this is simply a process. Right? I mean, maybe these are simply stages in a process. So I don't want to sound kind of too catastrophic about it. I mean, maybe this is simply the historical phase that we're going through. And and history doesn't move in moments. I mean, it moves in kind of, you know, sort of processes, basically. Um, so on, on the, uh, on, on Nagorno-Karabakh back. So, you know, to me, okay, so you'll, you'll recall that in, in the global strategy, uh, there is a, I'm really fond of this paragraph, a nice little paragraph on contact groups. It was actually the most controversial one to write. But this is to me really an instance where something like that really should have been done and rethought. I mean, it is very clear that as the conflict um, sort of reconfigured on the one hand, and as, uh, you know, basically what we have is we have the Minsk group. So France is in the Minsk group. And the truth is that because of the way in which French foreign policy evolved and because of the way in which the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict has evolved, France is on one side of the conflict. I mean, it, is, it basically kind of very clearly takes one side, uh, you know, given this, the, the deterioration of its relations with, with Turkey. And I don't think, I mean, I think the, the point is that a contact group within the EU should be representative of the various positions within the EU. So, you know, I think that it would have been, you know, the thing to do was not on an, on a, neck, uh, on a, on a security and defense field. I mean, I don't think that we should have intervened in Nagorno-Karabakh. What I do think is that within the framework, for instance, of the OSCE, um, uh, you know, maybe a couple, you know, two or three more member states. Uh, and I think there was a moment in which actually Russia was willing to go move in this direction, but we just didn't push that door. And basically saying, well, how about having Sweden, Germany and Italy alongside France uh, enter the Minsk group, for instance. Uh, and, and I think that that would have enabled us obviously not to have an impact on the outcome of the war, but wars at some point end, and you know it would have given us more of a foot into the, in a sense, sort of you know peace building phase, which I think now we have completely excluded ourselves uh, from. So that's on Nagorno Karabakh. On Tonkhead's uh, question of sort of hard, uh, soft, and, and and hard power, uh, and and yes, you know, I, I think that in, in a sense we can always build more instruments. Huh? I mean, and we all will always need more capabilities. So again, uh, don't take what I'm, what I'm about to say as an argument against continuing in this direction. But I reconnect this to the answer that I was giving uh, Martina earlier. To me, the problem is not that we don't have the capabilities. The, to me, the problem is that we don't use the capabilities that we have. I mean, we're not living in a world in which we have 2011 style Libya operations on the horizon where objectively we would not have the capabilities of doing. I mean, we're just not in that world anymore. The capabilities that we need to, for instance, to stick to the Libya example, to do peacekeeping in Libya, uh, we have them. Uh, we just we just don't want to use them, and we don't want to use them because we don't want to take the risk uh, 
uh, entails in, in using them. So again, you know, I am in the same way as I am reticent about um, writing papers, I'm perhaps obviously less reticent about actually building capabilities, but I would love to see that, you know, even more than building capabilities, I would love to see that the capabilities that we have uh, are, actually, are actually used. And finally, on, on Rafael's question, well, what to say? I think this is the most important issue of all. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, okay, we, we may no longer live in a world in which we are a normative uh, power, um, but very clearly, even if we don't live in that world anymore, we simply don't have a leg to stand on uh, if we don't respect our own uh, rules and norms and practices. I mean, you know, what is even the point talking about autonomy, which should be about respecting our, our norms, rules, and, 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 uh, and, and laws, if we are the ones kind of voluntarily violating them, basically, you know? which is why I think that the uh, an equally important element to this whole autonomy, which is obviously a sort of, it has an external um, sort of projection to it, uh, is actually delivering on the rule of law mechanism. I mean, it is about strengthening our own democratic resilience. Uh, that is the most important piece of the puzzle uh, of all, in my view. You're muted. I'm trying to demute myself. I've not succeeded. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, for this uh, survey. Uh, I, I think we might still be able to take uh, uh, two more questions, maximum three. Anybody else willing to come in, please do. You have a chance. The last chance for a few weeks, at least, to speak with Natalie Tocci. Who would like to come in? You're all very pensive at the moment, but... Um, I mean, uh, Natalie, you said, and, and somebody else will come in with another uh, uh, question, I hope soon. Um, you you spoke about, also in the global strategy, about um, uh, relations with big actors. And I mean, you said you're sort of, uh, you're asked for your advice by the high representative on ongoing situations. Now, I mean, uh, this is perhaps indiscreet, but if we revert uh, to the issue of his visit to Moscow, I mean, what, what was or would have... I knew it. <laughs> what would have been your advice or what was your advice in advance? And what is your feeling now that it has happened? And perhaps somebody else has another question. Anybody else wishing to come in? Yes, actually, I have a question, which is rather on practical thing than uh, about um, speaking about uh, how you um, deal with politics. How uh, maybe Maybe it's a little bit funny, but how you apply for your job, for your position, how did you get your position? I mean, you were already in the structure, in the institution, or like there was, um, yeah, I was just wondering how is it possible that you like get into the position? How does one become senior advisor? Another question? Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Director Tachi. Thanks to be with us. I'm Silvia, I'm Italian. Um, before you spoke about multilateralism as the key to solve important issues such as migration, energy, and so on. So, um, first question, just to it's for me to better understand. So, multilateralism, uh, do you intend multilateralism within states, for example, uh, um, to cooperate between states or on topics? Uh, and uh, follow up question. Um, if I think about neighbor countries, especially southern countries, which is the area where I study, um, I have the, 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 the feeling that neighbor countries uh, don't like multilateralism, they prefer bilateralism in dealing uh, about topics, especially for migration, energy, and so on. So my question maybe is a little bit daring. So how European Union can in concrete make multilateralism more appealing, both for member states and both for neighbor countries? Thank you. I think we've given you a big chunk of questions for the remaining five minutes, uh, but you're good at uh, summing up things. So Natalie, the floor is yours. Okay, so on, uh, on the Moscow visit, uh, my, my advice was, well, you know, you have two options here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mean, given, you know, given that there had been the Biden speech on foreign policy, which obviously put a big emphasis on Russia, given the Navalny situation, so you've got two options here. You either play it safe and not go, uh, and, uh, and you know, no, one, no one's going to criticize you for that. I mean, you know, everyone's going to think that it's exactly the right thing to do. Or if you want to be daring, uh, you go, but you really go for it. Mm? Uh, as in, you know, you really make a, a splash of it, uh, meaning, you know, you go to the Navalny hearing and, and, and you meet, meet with, you know, I'm not quite sure um, whether real civil society actually, um, <laughs> he managed to find it anywhere. Uh, but anyway, you know, you, you, really, you really go for it. Huh? You really make a point of going, going because, precisely because of this moment. Huh? Um, I think it was extremely unfortunate because even though that was obviously the intention, it just didn't, it, 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 that just didn't happen. Um, so I, I think, I, I think it was, it was, it was awful uh, in all honesty. And this obviously remains <laughs> in between, uh, in between this, uh, uh, this, you know, on, on the screen. Um, so, uh, Katharsia, so on, on the, on, so I had you applied, well, I didn't apply. Um, uh, you know, the, these are positions where indeed, you know, the sort of, the, the, you know, there has to be a personal relationship. I mean, they are appointments by the, the you know, by the high representative. Um, in the case of Mogherini, um, I had been her advisor when she was Italian foreign minister. She had then asked me to go into the cabinet and I didn't want to do that because I wanted to remain kind of half out. Uh, and I, in fact, I, I, you know, initially I said no. Uh, and, then, and then I thought, oh, I'm gonna really regret this. And so someone said, hey, you know, there are these positions of special advisors. So I said, oh, I can be that. And, um, and then, you know, with, uh, with, with Borrell, I mean, you know, I, again, I, I, I knew him uh, and he knew what I had done with, with her and she just, he just asked me to stay. So I, I'm not a very good example in this respect because there isn't a sort of formal procedure to become a special, special advisor. It's not like you do a concours or, or, or something. Um, Silvia, on the multilateralism uh, question, um, I mean, I think that, you know, it really depends on, you know, on, on what is the problem you're trying to solve, what is the issue, what, what you know, and, and you, 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 to me, you start from there, you know, what is, you know, are you talking about <clears throat> whatever, migration as opposed to climate, as opposed to non-proliferation? And then you say, well, what is the, what are the countries that I have to, kind of you know find an agreement with in order to deliver on this and what is the institutional framing which is most appropriate to do this huh? and and at times it will be something with a fairly rigid quote-unquote institutional framing like the UN and at times if you want to get things done and done fast it will probably not huh? and you need to kind of act in, in smaller formats and then there's a question of you know, how do you link those two together? So for instance, you know, you have uh, a key non-proliferation agreement like, um, you know, let's see if it will be revived now, but the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran that really um, brings these two elements together. You know, you have the sort of flexibility and nimbleness of a small group, but then you anchor it to the United Nations through a UN Security Council resolution. But the point is you start with the, with the problem, with the issue, and then you figure out how, how do you do multilateralism in a way which is effective, uh, to, use that, to use that term. And then as to the question of, you know, sort of, you know, neighbors, they prefer bilateralism. You know, to me, um, whether it's, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily against bilateralism, by the way. I mean, in fact, I actually think that sometimes multilateralism is, um, is not even necessarily the best, the best way to go. I mean, you know, one only needs to look at, for instance, the, the Eastern Mediterranean to realize that there have been forms of multilateralism in the region, which are, in my view, detrimental to peace. Uh, I mean, you know, think about the way in which the East Med Gas Forum has been configured as a everyone against Turkey forum. 
I mean, that is multilateral, but frankly speaking, it is not a forum that has been, I mean, it has its uses, but it's a highly politicized forum, um, which in my view does actually not bridge divides, it consolidates them. So I, I don't wanna give the impression that multilateralism is, is always and necessarily good, which in a sense is why I answered the previous question the way, the way I did. So again, you know, with, with neighbors, um, you know, to, to me, the question is, you know, what is it that you want uh, from, you know, uh, from or with a particular country? Uh, and, and at times you achieve that multilaterally, at times you won't. But the point is that whatever you do, so let's take migration as an example, you need to make sure that you don't just think about what you want for yourself. <laughs> you need to think about what actually works with the country with which you're actually trying to find an agreement. Uh, and the sort of quote unquote social contract of the relationship has, has to work. So, you know, if you try and uh, forge migration partnerships with uh, different countries, you know, transit and origin countries in Africa, uh, and you are perhaps, yes, willing to give a bit of aid, uh, but you're not willing to give anything on labor migration, and you're not willing to reform your asylum system, and you're not willing to kind of do anything, well, that is not a social contract that, that works, which does not mean to say that you don't find an agreement, you may, but that agreement is not going to deliver what, what it was intended to deliver. Natalie, thank you very much. Um, let me say, I have one short comment uh, with regard uh, to the question on how one becomes a senior advisor. I mean, the European institutions and other bureaucracies are full of gray men with gray hair and gray suits who were doers at one point. And then one discovered that their capacity at doing was limited and they are given honorific titles of senior advisors and shunted to the sidelines. But I'm not sure that many of these people produce very valid advice. Uh, your way uh, into this operation is the other way around. You've always been, you've always, as you said, you've been a thinker, you've developed all sorts of ideas. I think that students have seen here today how, how important and how innovative this uh, whole process was that you introduced with a global strategy and you're helping people to do. So thank you very much for giving us uh, this experience. I understand that this is the last day where uh, Natalin operates on online. From tomorrow onwards, you will, will have physical activities again. I will be involved in one of them in the afternoon. So we very much hope that based on this first virtual experience, we can also welcome you to Natalin uh, physically in the months and years to come. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for what I thought was a very lively and interesting discussion. Good evening to everyone. And thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.